Hi, this is Ben from EnglishPhotography.com. A lot of you have watched my Fuji X-E1 X Pro 1 comparison. Well, now I've got the new Fuji X M1, the um, same sensor from the X Pro and X E1, but in a smaller consumer body. How does it work? And how does it weigh up against the other two? Let's have a look. I knew mirrorless cameras were the future when Fujifilm launched their X Pro 1. Small and light like a Leica, but with the practicality of autofocus. It had the image quality to live up to its name. When Fujifilm put the same innovative X-Trans sensor in the XE1, I recommended it over its bigger brother. Well, you've just done it again. The new XM1 has the same amazing sensor in a smaller, lighter, cheaper camera body. Don't confuse it with the XA1, which doesn't have the X-Trans sensor. Or with the X100S, which can't change lenses. Or with the new XE2, which is better, but more expensive. We're paying less, so we get less. What's missing, and what do we miss? The X-Pro1 had a hybrid optical and electronic viewfinder and the screen. The X-E1 lost the optical viewfinder, so action and low light photography was trickier, but gave us an upgraded electronic viewfinder, apparently from Sony's top-end RX1. The XM1 has no viewfinder, so you have to compose with the screen. In practice, this means less battery life, shakier pictures, and poor visibility and bright light. But now the screen tilts, which I like. These videos are actually recorded with the XM1. The high ISA performance is good, as it was with the XE, uh, XE1 and X Pro1. However, the noise reduction algorithms are a bit more strong than they were on the previous two pro cameras. So what it will do is actually smooth out detail words before it will keep it. You can get some of the detail back in, in raw mode of course, but in JPEGs, and I think movies as well, it's, um, it's a sacrifice of detail at high ISAs in favour of a smoother picture, which a lot of people want. There's the camera. Looks nice. Comes in black, silver and brown. Very similar, if not almost identical, to the XA1. The XM1 is set apart from the XE1 and X Pro1 by its built-in Wi-Fi. Going through the menus here, which are actually very easy to navigate, you can find the Wi-Fi. We're going to go through the process now, so you can see how to do it. This is the wireless settings. This is what you're looking at. And what we want to do is actually move it so that we don't resize the photographs when we import them or export them. There's a photograph. And here's the Apple iPod. Works with Android as well. Fujifilm have their own app. Which is reasonably well developed. It's somewhere in here. There we are. Fujifilm Photo Receiver. So you press connect. Scroll through these menus. Right, here we are. Wireless transfer. So we send individual image. Searching. Now what that does is it, it turns on the Wi-Fi on the Fuji camera. And then on the actual mobile device could be an iPad, could be anything else. You find the actual wireless network for the camera. In this case, it's Fujifilm XM1. When you're connected, which I am now, you see the tick, you go back to the Fujifilm photo receiver app. Press connect. And then the camera will then send the photograph to the phone or tablet. And it's actually quite quick to do so. This is very useful because you can share photographs from the better camera, especially in low light, in, um, when you want more quality. And when you want those sort of Fujifilm colors that a phone camera obviously won't get. 
would then instantly upload them to um, social networks and uh, send them to people. So I transmit the photograph, and there it is. It's very quick. When you get the process sorted out, it's very intuitive as well. They go to your camera roll, where you can select them, view them obviously, and zoom in to check sharpness. But really what we want to do now is actually edit them a bit on the fly. So instead of going into Photoshop on a computer, you can just use a program like Snapseed, which I really recommend. And what that allows you to do is give a, a quick polish to the photograph so you can actually send off a, a fairly good photograph to uh, news outlets, social media, things like that. For professional work as well, this is a very useful feature. I was photographing a bike ride uh, for charity internationally, and they wanted Facebook updates. So it was simple just to take the photograph, transfer it via Wi-Fi, edit it a bit in Snapseed, and then upload it. But they really need to get onto their app developers and make sure that you can control the camera and record video from your iPod iPhone or mobile device. The Fuji XE1 had a couple of control dials that were really well machined, made of metal, and they were excellent for controlling the camera. The Fuji X Pro 1 was even better, and those cameras also had the aperture ring on the lens. The Fuji XM1 with its kit lens has no aperture control on the lens, nor does it have a control for the uh, image stabilization, which the lens does have nor does it have a control for manual focus. That's all on the menus. I find that with any company, the cheaper the camera is, the more controls are actually lost in the menus, buried in the menus. So for example, a really pro end uh, Nikon or Canon, everything is at your fingertips, literally. Whereas with something like this, you've got a few buttons on the back and you've actually got to go through the menus and have a look through that to actually change things. That said, the Fuji does have a quick menu that's very useful, allows you to get a lot of access to the most used settings. And it's got a very nicely made machined metal dial on the top for changing things like exposure compensation. And I really like that. However, for the aperture control or um, the shutter speed control when you're in manual mode, it's got this wheel on the back that you actually push in as well. I didn't realize that at first, but it's got a wheel on the back and I don't like it at all. It's, um, it's not very nice to use. It's, it feels like it would slip. It's not good. But the, um, the dial for the exposure compensation is excellent. They've still got the nicely machined metal dial on the top. And the lens itself doesn't slip. And is generally good quality. It's nice and metal. The body is, it feels a bit more plasticky, but it's lighter and I prefer that actually. I always prefer lighter cameras. The uh, XA1, which has just been announced, uh, this is uh, now September 2013, is essentially the same sort of camera body as the XM1, but the sensor is, you know, like a, a commonly used 16 megapixel one. It's not the X-Trans um, sensor that the X-Pro1, XE1 and XM1 share. So what I'm going to do is test the XM1 relative to the X-Pro1 and XE1 and then actually decide whether it might be better to go with the XA1 um, after all. The Fuji XM1 has a flash, which the Fuji XE1 had, and the Fuji X-Pro1 lacked. Again, it's one of those little flashes here that flicks up, looks quite absurd, but allows you to very easily tilt the flash to um, light the ceiling and actually bounce it. That said, the flash is very, very small and it's better to have an off-camera flash. You've got this standard hot shoe, so you can actually attach a, um, a TTL cable, for example, and use either Fuji flashes or one of the uh, manual Chinese flashes you can get from eBay, for example, and that allows you to make this quite a versatile flash camera. Again, you've got that focal plane shutter, and so you can actually sync the camera at faster shutter speeds for flash photography. Out of all the companies, Fujifilm really listen to their customers, and that shows in their firmware upgrades and their um, new camera releases. So last time I was really whinging about the X-Pro1 and the XE1 not having a tiltable LCD screen. It's more professional, but it's not very useful. Well, 
here we are. The Fuji XM1 has got a tiltable LCD screen. It tilts up or down, so I can use it like a waist level finder, or I can use it to shoot above my head technology in the crowd. Gets faster, this and technology is remarkable. Gets I love this feature. Really great. The XM1 is as small as we'd want to go. Some manufacturers have made the mistake mobile phone makers made a few years ago, sacrificing usability for diminutive size. Let's have a fiddle about with the camera and go through some of the modes. There's the precise metal dial on the top with the standard program aperture shutter manual. To turn the camera on, you've got the very Nikon star switch. It's very quick and I like it. The kit lens is back to being a kit lens, which is cheap and slow with a maximum aperture of 3.5, 3 to 5.6 at the long end, 16 to 50 millimeters. For the price, and especially in a kit, it's incredible value. This points to a characteristic of Fujifilm. They seem to understand what photographers want. Why? Well, they listen. The X-E1 had slow autofocus, the XE2 addresses this. The X series cameras were a bit pricey for most people. The XM1 and XA1 were launched. It's a pleasure to see a tiltable LCD screen on both. But there's a flaw in that cliched capitalist aphorism give the people what they want, as Steve Jobs made a billion proving. Often, they don't know until you show them. And so it is. The rush to flesh out the X system has led Fujifilm to launch too many cameras too quickly. Looking at the images online, for the bodies are almost identical, the XM1 has only a small advantage over the XA1, so why pay more? And actually it's not so easy as it was last time. The X-Pro1 was quite new and the X-E1 was also quite new. However, now the X-Pro1 and the X-E1 are, digitally speaking, a little bit old. And therefore that sensor that before really astounded us is looking a bit long in the tooth now. You see the image quality is amazing but this is a, a digital realm and digital cameras seem to be upgraded every year. So maybe the uh, Fujifilm Corporation have actually got an X-Pro2 or an X-E2 or whatever else it happens to be with a new sensor, maybe a full frame sensor. I've not heard any rumors to this, but I do know that they are gonna probably upgrade at some point, and it might be worth waiting. Not necessarily to get the actual cameras, like the X-Pro1, XE1, or even the XM1, but waiting to get an X-Pro1 or an XE1 cheaper. On the used market, when people upgrade to the X-Pro2 or X-Pro3 or whatever it happens to be. It's an interesting market, but with any of these cameras, you can't go wrong. They deliver the image quality, they're small and light, and uh, they're pretty much affordable. It comes down to how you'll use it. Photographing an international event for charity required social media engagement, and therefore built-in Wi-Fi, on the XM1 for example, was essential. If you're able, spend a bit more on the XE2 or X-Pro2 if, when it's announced. The quality will be a bit better, and you'll benefit from faster auto-focusing. Otherwise, Compare the used end-of-line price of an XE1 against the XM1 and XA1, weighing up Wi-Fi and tiltable LCD on the XM1A1 against slightly better quality and a viewfinder on the XE1. Ultimately, it's a quality problem of too much choice. Pick one and just photograph with it. This was in Barcelona on the streets, just uh, photograph people as they come past. For example here, edited in... Uh, Google uh, with their um, Nick software plugins. Very green eyes. These are actually JPEGs from the camera because the Silky Pix developer studio is a, a pain to use and the JPEGs are good enough, especially for web resolution. For the ultimate quality, make sure that you convert the raw files.
These are just trees in Barcelona. You've got this lovely colour. Some people have a bit of trouble with the greens with the Fujifilm cameras. And they seem okay to me. This is the Sagrada Familia. I've lightened the shadows just a bit. And here I lightened the sky a little bit. Darken the shadows to increase the contrast. This was in a fish tank, and therefore the white balance had to be set manually. Graffiti artists in Barcelona. And basketball. This was a photo shoot I uh, found on the street and saw this chap talking on the phone and a baby. The colours look very natural but slightly slightly processed and that I hope you've enjoyed this video by Englishphotographer.com filmed by Hiromi Torres from HiromiTorres.com two hours. It's been interesting. It goes back to the Fuji X-E1 X-Pro1 reviews, obviously. It's a bit of a pain not to have a viewfinder and to compose on the LCD screen. But then one of the things about the camera is that you get good quality in a very small and light body with small lenses. To have that sort of quality in a cheaper body is good. But... Fuji have launched the XA1, the XE2, and I'm sure they must be working on an X Pro 2. There's a lot of cameras in their Fuji X trans range now, and therefore which really to choose? How to choose between them? It's up to you really. Looking at these things, these reviews on YouTube, reading reviews online, you don't really get a sense of actually using the camera. So it's worth going to a physical camera shop and playing around and seeing which one suits you best. This is just my thumbs, my virtual thumbs, messing about with a virtual camera. It's almost life size if your screen is sized as mine is. But you don't get the tactile feedback. So, for example, the metal dials on the top of the Fuji XM1 like the XE1, X Pro one before it, they're really nice to use. The dial that you see next to those nine dots, hello that one there, isn't so nice to use. It's quite plasticky, but you can't really read that in a specification sheet. That one. You can't really get a feel of it without holding the camera. So read the specifications to actually rule out which cameras you won't get. So for example, if you really need a viewfinder, for example, for sports photography, it's quite useful to have street photography again, though the tiltable LCD is good for street photography, then certain cameras will be ruled out. Narrow your choices down, and then go into a camera shop, and actually try them out. Of course, I've got to recommend not going online and then buying the camera cheaper, much as I want to. Because if we all did that, then there wouldn't be any physical camera shops, and we couldn't go and try them out. So, I hope you've enjoyed the review. Leave any comments below, ask any questions, and I'll try and get back to you. Thanks so much. Ha ha ha.